Good morning and welcome. So glad you're here on this Lord's Day to worship together with your brothers and sisters in beautiful Isla Mirada, Florida, contrasted to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I was this week, three degrees, blowing snow, not fit for man or animal. So some of you have figured that out and are down here during this time of year, and I recognize your wisdom. This week, uh, we have a normal church schedule, which you can find on the front of your bulletin. If uh, you don't have one, I'll give you mine on the way down from the stage, but uh, normal week for us. Uh, next week is uh, the first Sunday fellowship, so... I would love for you to plan on staying after service next week and joining us in the upper room for some food and fellowship and uh, would love to taste your fish that everybody knows you for. If you're able to bring that, uh, I would love to sample it. Uh, next week begins February and uh, the new table talks are in the back. If you've never taken advantage of that, uh, two characteristics of this devotional there are several articles in there about different topics that you may find good for continuing education. And then there's a daily devotional for each day of the month uh, leading you through the scriptures. So a great resource back on the table if you want to make yourself available to that on the way out. Um, today is uh, Angelo's last Sunday with us. So that's uh, exciting for him that his house is working out to uh, up north mid florida uh sad for us uh he'll be reading the scriptures after the the singing this morning and uh, angelo you've been a great blessing to this body and this fellowship and may the lord bless you and bless others through you as he moves you up there um i tried to disapprove his move but uh apparently i actually have no authority i love you angelo thank thanks for you Let's a schedule. Um, we're going to to worship through singing uh, overhead and through the speakers uh, with YouTube this morning. Give Craig a little break as he's been recovering uh, from being under the weather this week. So uh, we'll follow the music director on the TV screens this morning. Uh, we had a great conversation about singing in Sunday school. Uh, you're familiar with Ephesians chapter five and. Um, I think we were in 15 to 21 or so, but it, it talked about uh, not being drunk with wine, in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another with psalms and spiritual songs. And we talked about how, uh, you know, when people in the world uh, go to bars and they get drunk and they get loose lips and they start singing these songs uh, spontaneously and they're no good, um, but, but Paul makes a reference that, you know, when you're filled with the Spirit and thinking about who God is and what He has done on your behalf, that also should lead you into singing. And so may He fill us with His Spirit this morning as we sing together. Um, for our call to worship, uh, I'll be reading from Psalm chapter 24, verse 7 through 10. Lift up your heads you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, and lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the King of glory. Father, as we prepare to worship you through singing and then through the listening to your scriptures and then through giving of our tithes and offerings and then through the preaching of your word, we ask that you would join us in this place, that you would fill each of us with your spirit, that you would give us a recognition of who you are and what you have done on our behalf, that our hearts would be overflowing with joy that our lips would sing your praises, making a joyful noise in our hearts to you. We love you because you have first loved us. Thank you for this Lord's Day as we sing to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please stand as uh, Greg gets the YouTube going.
Brian, thank you for your kind words and sentiments. Those sentiments are mine as well, to you, Craig, Steve, for the entire church. I love you all. It's been a great blessing to be a part of this church. I thank God for that. I thank God for pastors who faithfully preach the word of God, who are faithfully dedicated to Jesus Christ and him crucified and him alone for our eternal destiny. We'll continue to pray for this church, and I pray that God will continue to bless all of you. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 17 to 22, through 22. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, who was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Faith in God is not something we are naturally born with. Instead, it is given to us by God through his loving kindness, his grace. It's a miraculous gift with which we are born again, not naturally, of course, but spiritually, with repentance and believing and trusting in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. With this faith, we become increasingly aware of God's goodness. Listen now to the words of Psalm 111, in which the author praises God for his goodness. Psalm 111, praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord, they are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made known his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. He has made known to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. In prayer and through our giving, let's express our thankfulness to the Lord for for his goodness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as always, we are deeply thankful for your amazing gift of salvation through faith alone in Jesus alone. In addition, you provide for us far beyond all comp- comprehension. Even, <clears throat> even though everything we have is already yours, we want to say thank you and also honor you through giving. May our offerings be fruitful in glorifying the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. There's an offering plate here in the front and also one in the back.
chapter 1 as uh, we pray this morning. Father, I thank you in all my remembrance for the saints that you have gathered here this morning at First Baptist Isle Morada, filling my prayers with joy because of their partnership in the gospel. God, that you have brought these people from the world into your kingdom and you have united us in Christ and we are brothers and sisters. We are family members supporting and loving one another. What a gift that is from you to have the church, to be seated next to allies, friends, partners. Thank you for our partnership. God, we are certain of this, that you, who began a good work in us, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And as we think about that day of Jesus Christ, it's obviously in the future. And so give us patience with one another. As you are not finished working on us yet, we have sanctification that is yet to occur and you are working in each of our lives in the different circumstances to bring about more faith more trust more Christ likeness and so as we walk this journey this side of heaven may we be good brothers and sisters to one another may we love one another well may we pray for one another may we be patient with one another as you make us more like the Lord Jesus. Father, we are thankful that you have made us all partakers of grace. That which we have not deserved, you have freely given us in the beloved. That is the good news of the gospel, and we pray that you would use us to be a light in the upper keys to make that good news of the gospel known. Lord, may you convince those around us who suffer from affluenza that their money and their things are not the end-all, be-all, but that eternity lies before us and relationship with Christ Almighty is the pinnacle. Father, it is our prayer that your love may abound in us more and more with knowledge and all discernment. God, we recognize that knowledge, true knowledge, comes from your word. May your word determine our opinion on the news. May your word determine our vote at the polling office. May your word give us discernment in our everyday decisions so that we may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless For the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Lord, cause us to be characterized by these things, excellence, pureness, blamelessness, filled with the fruit of righteousness. God, cause us to walk in this manner, not so that people would say, oh, what a wonderful person that is but so that you might receive glory and praise. God, as Pastor Craig comes now to preach and proclaim what your word says to us, I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would inspire us to walk in holiness and in obedience, that you would empower us to do the right thing at the right time, that you would give us faith to endure the trials of the circumstances that you have put each of us in. And all these things, the purpose we pray is that you would be glorified, you would be honored. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Please uh, go ahead and take your Bibles out, and let's open up to Genesis chapter 50. And maybe you've noticed uh, 50 is the last chapter, and so we are <clears throat> uh, coming to the end here and concluding our journey through the book of Genesis. Uh, it's a journey that began back September 20th of 2020. Uh, so we've been in there for quite some time. 
uh, almost two and a half years or so, I guess that is, and uh, began with a, a sermon entitled simply, In the Beginning, very fitting, right, for Genesis 1-1. And uh, it's, it's been 102 sermons, I think, as of today. And I say all that to, to say that I pray it has uh, been beneficial to our sanctification. And even as I say that, I know that it has been, and it is, because uh, Isaiah tells us that God's word does not return void. And so uh, we know that it has accomplished exactly what he has ordained for it to accomplish. And so we we'll give thanks for that. I'm grateful for that indeed. Uh, I can certainly share with you that for me personally, uh, it has been very uh, edu educational. It's been very uh, transformational. Uh, we have gone through the book of Genesis, uh, I know, in men's Bible study several years ago and uh, continue to read through. And as you read through the scriptures, it is just an amazing thing how uh, you can read it over and over and over and study it over and over and over. You could just, we could just go through Genesis continually, continually, continually. And yet you'll continue to be shaped and molded uh, by God's word and by the spirit that has caused us to be born again, as, as Pastor Brian uh, just read from Philippians there. And, uh, you know, it's just a, an amazing thing. Uh, but the last three weeks we have been looking at these bedside blessings of Israel, of, of Jacob. And so we've seen how uh, not only has he blessed his sons, but he's also blessed his grandsons. Remember in chapter 48 how uh, he knew that he was close to death and he called Joseph, uh, his, the favorite son, right, to come and to bring his two boys or two young men, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, and he blessed them. And then he called <coughs> his 12 sons to him, to also bestow a blessing on them uh, that the scriptures tell us was an adequate blessing for each of them. And so in that, remember how uh, he was inspired, Israel was, by the Spirit of God, that he was speaking prophetically. Not only was he giving a blessing to each of these individual men, but he was speaking of the future of these tribes that would come from these 12 sons of his as, as they would continue to multiply and become a, a large nation, which we know goes back to God's word and his promise to To maybe recall is the one given um, certainly to Joseph, as we already kind of talked about. He received the birthright, the blessing that would typically or customarily go to the firstborn son. Uh, it wouldn't normally go to the eleventhborn son, which is uh, what number Joseph was. But we know that again, God is the one orchestrating all of this, and so he receives the double portion of the inheritance as his sons Ephraim and Manasseh will both receive allotment of land as they get into the promised land later. Uh, we also saw a significant uh, blessing bestowed upon Judah, uh, the fourth-born son. Remember, he was given the blessing of uh, authority and leadership over not just his brothers, but uh, remember how the Scripture told us that the scepter would not depart uh, from Judah until Shiloh comes. And so we know that that is tied into a messianic prophecy. Uh, we know that Judah, uh, through him, will come the line of the rightful rulers, the rightful um, representatives and kings of the nation of Israel, and ultimately uh, it will come to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as that is, again, a, a prophecy of the Messiah, of the Christ, the one who we call Jesus, as he will rule and reign, and currently does, certainly in our hearts, will rule and reign one day on this planet for a thousand years and then for all of eternity. And so this uh, speaks of him to come as well. Uh, we finish up chapter 49 last week uh, by completing these blessings to Israel and his sons. And then uh, in verse 33, it says that when Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet until the, into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So as we transition today into our, our final chapter here, uh, we're going to look and see Israel's funeral. We're going to look at the death of Joseph also. Of this text, uh, Matthew Henry wrote and said, Thus the book of Genesis, which began with the origin of light and life, ends with nothing but death and darkness. So sad a change has sin made. And it has. Sin has changed everything. Uh, however, it has also revealed to us our need of a Savior. It has revealed to us uh, just how glorious the grace of God is, as we've already spoken too much this morning, as we should continue to speak to over and over and over and always uh, that we be pointed to this, this marvelous grace, I think of uh, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, right, and, and singing psalms and hymns of words that we should think of and just this, this amazing grace that He has bestowed upon us. 
uh, sin had left a crimson stain. They're just coming now. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Uh, this is what we give thanks and give praise to him for. Well, we pick up the narrative this morning in verse 1 of chapter 50. So if you have your Bibles open, please follow along with me. <laughs> then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants and the physicians to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Now 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. When the days of mourning for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If I now have found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am about to die. In my grave which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the arrow, uh, elders excuse me, of the land of Egypt. Verse 8, And all the household of Joseph and his brothers and his father's household, they left only their little ones and their flocks and their herds in the land of Goshen. There, there also went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor at Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation. And he observed seven days mourning for his father. Now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore, it was named Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. Thus his son did for him as he charged them. And for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with the field for a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions of your servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. For am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for blessing us with it, for preserving it for us, that we would have it placed before us this morning. God, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ, hearing this gospel that we sing about, that we give you thanks for, Lord, that we proclaim in this place. So Lord, as we do that again this morning, pray that if anyone be here that do not know you as Lord and Savior, God, that you would go out and do what you, only you can do, that your spirit would give them a new heart and cause them uh, to be regenerated, cause them to understand uh, this gift of faith, Lord, that you would grant to them, and uh, that today would be a day of salvation for them. Lord, for your people, for, for your church, I pray for encouragement for us, for application for us, for understanding for us, Lord, of the things that you have for us today. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of today's sermon is, uh, What Was Meant? And uh, by this, you know, just 
simply speaking to the overarching theme that we have seen through the book of Genesis, uh, a principle and a truth of the providence of God, the sovereignty of God in all things. Uh, what was meant in all of this that we've seen some 2,500 years or so of, of human history in the book of Genesis, what was meant in all of creation, and what in fact was meant before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians tells us. So all of this, uh, all the scriptures teach to say uh, that it's all been done to the praise of His glory and grace that has all been done and is all continuing to, to go according to his plan and according to the fruition of that plan every day uh, until he sees the end of this world and changes and we go into the next age, into all of eternity, uh, spending in uh, the new heaven, new earth. All these things are going exactly according to his plan and his sovereign will. And we've seen that in the life of Joseph, haven't we? That's been a focus of, of since chapter 37. A lot of the life of Joseph, we see God's hand. Uh, of course, Abraham and Isaac and all those that are mentioned before that also. And we continue to see his hand upon our world today and upon our lives today. And we will continue to see that in our text here today. Well, the text is divided into three sections. Uh, we have the funeral and the burial of uh, Israel. We have the pro proclamation of God's goodness and his sovereignty. And then we close with the death of Joseph. So we first begin with the funeral of a patriarch. Okay, funeral of a patriarch. We begin in verse 1. Joseph is mourning the loss of his father. We saw the passing of Israel last week in the prior chapter. And now we see Joseph and his brothers mourning the loss of Israel. Not only are they and their family mourning the loss of Israel, but we see all of Egypt, it says, mourn for him for 70 days. What a remarkable like, reverence and respect they have for this man. Remember how when Israel came, he blessed, in fact, Pharaoh. And we know that the greater always blesses the lesser. And so there's a, a respect here that's been growing and growing among this nation for Israel. Remember how when he came into them, uh, into Israel, they in fact lived in the land of Goshen. Remember as Joseph instructed them, tell Pharaoh that you are all shepherds. Because remember why they did that? Yes, in God's sovereignty and His providence, His protection to keep them out of the main land of Egypt and keep them in, in Goshen. We will see that come to play later in the book of Exodus as they are in the land of Goshen and not in Egypt where all the plagues are happening. And so, you know, God's design is perfect and we see all of that. Uh, but remember how, uh, what they thought of shepherds. Remember the Egyptians thought that they were loathsome. Uh, they thought that, that shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians. And so uh, this was done, and, and that's how they thought of this family that was coming in. Now we fast forward some 17 years later, and we see such a great affection and such a great respect for Israel and for these shepherds that came into their land. And just again, what a blessing they were to Pharaoh, and, and as Joseph has been there for him for years now, and just the blessings that God has continued to bestow on Egypt because of Joseph and because of Israel. And, you know, we see that as God's children. People should see God in us right? Just thinking of some application for us. People should see God in us. It may not, um, it may not manifest itself in an abundant blessing to the nations and to all the people around us. It may, but it may not. It may manifest its, itself in different ways. Uh, in our lives, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what's happening in our lives, people should recognize a difference in us, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17, uh, says that if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation, uh, that all old things have passed away and that all things are becoming new, right? And that's what's happened to us. We have been born again. We are different. We are no longer who we once were, amen? Anyone can say that and attest to that? I am no longer the person I once was. I'm not perfect, and I'm still continuing in this process of sanctification, but I'm no longer the person I once was. I have been transformed, and you have been transformed by the power of the gospel, and that should be manifested. That should be evident to everyone who is around us and what other the circumstances are. Uh, we talked about that actually much this morning in some of the prayer request time in, in Sunday school. And so no matter how difficult, no matter what it looks like, uh, you know, we should be representing the Lord and people should see that in us at all times. And why is it that we're called to do that? So that our actions, our speech, our, our everything about us, uh, our behavior 
again, that people would see God, that we are pointing to God through everything in our lives, everything that he's done. And what exactly is it that he's done? Again, he has changed us. He has transformed us. He has, as Peter says, drawn us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, First John, uh, the men and the women are both going through study right now in Bible study. Uh, so we invite you to join us, men on Monday night and uh, women on Wednesday nights, and the times are in your bulletin there. But First John 1.15 tells us that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Uh, so he is light. Second Corinthians 4.6 God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And that's what it's all about. Uh, That's why we gather here this morning to worship Him, because He has enlightened us, because He has granted us to see the light of this gospel that saves This is the gospel that is necessary for salvation. I think of Acts 4.12 and how it says that uh, there is no, there's salvation and no other, right? That there is no other name given under heaven among men by which you must be saved. Everything about this study of Genesis, everything about every study we will ever have in this Bible moving forward in this church, all points to Jesus Christ and God's love for us and the gospel and this good news. Because remember, There is good news because first, there is bad news. The bad news is the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that all who have ever been born are born in sin and walk in sin and only know sin and are corrupted by sin. That's uh, the doctrine of the depravity of man is what we call it, that we are totally tainted, 100% tainted by our sin nature. Our will, our heart is desperately uh, evil and wicked, the Bible says, and who can know it? Who can know the evil and the wickedness of man? And we see it all on display on the world around us. We know it within ourselves and who we were outside of Christ. So the Bible clearly says that. And the grace and the gift of God that is so amazing is that he chooses to reveal to us that that is the true state of who we are outside of Christ then he made a way for us to be in Christ and to be reconciled back to him so that we can have a proper relationship with him and not be under the condemnation that comes because of our sin and the wrath of God that abides on us because of that sin. That is not a place where we want anyone to be. That's why we proclaim the good news of this gospel, that Jesus became man. He took on flesh to be like one of us so that he could live the life that we could never live And just achieving that bar of perfection that we cannot attain. He was able to do that in flesh and blood, and that's why he had to do it, so that he could die as a man, yet being God, able to raise himself from the dead three days later, showing that he, in fact, conquered death and conquered sin and defeated Satan and defeated the foes that hold us down and these chains that just bind us and hold on to us and drag us down literally into the pits of hell. He has saved us because he lived that sinful life. He was able to pay for the sins of all those who will ever believe in him. Glory, hallelujah, that's that's the gospel. That's the good news and the greatest news you'll hear today and you will ever hear. So I say to you today, as Paul says, uh, today, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, next in our, in our text, we see Joseph spoke with Pharaoh and asked him, saying, can I please go? My father made me swear that I would do this act for him. And we see that Pharaoh not only grants him permission to go on his journey, but he blesses him uh, by allowing him to go and gives him, I mean, the royal treatment. You look here in the text, he, he sends an entire entourage with, with Joseph. He, he is just like as Pharaoh. Remember, he's second only to Pharaoh in the throne. He sends all the elders of Egypt. He sends uh, protection with him for this journey that he's going on so that they would all be protected. As it says, there's horses and, and horsemen and chariots. So he is sent out, uh, you know, with the, um, the secret service, if you will, right, to go and take care of Joseph and his family as they go. It says there in verse 9 that uh, it was a very large company, Okay, so that we know that it was a very large group of people going to do this. 
Now it says they arrive at the threshing floor of Atad. This is a place uh, near Hebron. Remember Hebron? Uh, so many months back, it's been a while since we talked about it, but that's where Isaac grew up. That's where Jacob grew up. Uh, they lived there in the land of Canaan. And so this is near that, that place. The, they lamented, it says, and mourned for Israel another seven days. And so much mourning that the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, recognize this. And thinking that they're all Egyptians, they say, what an amazing, mournful time this is for the Egyptians. And that's, in fact, what this name means here, uh, Abel Mizraim. It means the mourning of Egypt. So this was on display for all the inhabitants of Canaan to see. And then Joseph and his brothers buried their father in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, just as he had required and requested of them. So Israel's laid to rest. <clears throat> Remember there where Abraham, way back in chapter 23, I believe it is, where we see the death of his wife Sarah, he buys that first plot, and that's really the first um, possession that he has in this promised land, right, is this burial site. And so now we see that he is buried with his wife Leah, we learned from the end of chapter 49, where also his parents Isaac and Rebekah are buried, where also his grandparents Abraham and Sarah are buried. Uh, next, we see uh, how Joseph is uh, used as an instrument of God. Okay, Joseph is an instrument of God. Let's look down at verse 15. Uh, this is a remarkable thing here. It appears that Joseph's brothers believe that their father Israel was really the only thing uh, keeping the peace between them and Joseph, that uh, it was their dad who was holding together the household. In the next couple of verses, uh, we're going to see the fear of these brothers, and we're also going to see the love of Joseph, right? His brothers are, are worried, and you see what they're worried? They're, they're scared, saying, our father has died now. Now Joseph is going to just tear into us. Now Joseph is going to give us what we deserve. And remember them saying that, we deserve Joseph's punishment. And Joseph, remember, is in the place in the, of authority to do whatever he wants to to these brothers, and they've been well aware of that since they found out uh, that he is Joseph. So they're worried and they're scared at this point of what Joseph will do. It says, in fact, that uh, their father told them to, to beg, it says, Joseph for forgiveness. Now, certainly we don't know if uh, that was a, a command that he gave to them to go and talk to Joseph, or this is just an embellishment they're saying because they're fearful of what Joseph would do. And so, hey, dad said to tell you, right, that this is how you should treat us and that you should forgive us. But either way, Look at how Joseph responds. Look at verse 17. Joseph wept when his brother spoke this way to him. This broke Joseph's heart. It grieved him that they thought this way. Think about the timeline here. He has served them and taken care of their entire family for 17 years. 17 years this has been happening reconciliation that's been there, the, 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 my brothers are back and, and we're together that's been happening for almost two decades, and now that Israel dies, these brothers are just going like, hey man, please don't make us be your servants, please don't kill us, whatever it is you're going to do to us, please forgive us for, for these things. And so this grieves him, uh, Jacob, at, or excuse me, Joseph, and you know, he rightly reminds them here that their lives are not dependent upon Israel. Their lives are dependent upon God. And that's the overarching thing that we see here, certainly in chapter 50, uh, is the sovereignty of God in all of this. Well, in verse 18, we see this is now the fourth time, I believe, that Joseph's brothers bow before him. We see they drop to their knees, they're begging for their lives, saying, we are your servants. But Joseph graciously, again, kindly, lovingly speaking to them, says, do not be afraid. Do not be fearful. Do not feel the way that you feel. Continuing in verse 20, he says, as for you, you meant evil against me. And they certainly did mean evil against him. Remember, they, they desired to kill him. Only in God's providence did, you know, Reuben leave and Judah suggests, let's profit off this, and let's throw them in a pit, and then they say, let's sell them to some Ishmaelites, right? Again, this is God orchestrating all of this as we see what has happened from that time on. His hand is upon all of this, as, as Joseph says here, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people 
alive. And this echoes Joseph's life, really. Everything we've seen about Joseph. He, he, in fact, said this to them in chapter 45 when they came back. He said, do not be grieved or do not be angry with yourselves for what you have done to me because God is the one who did this to send me ahead of you to preserve life so that you would be preserved, you and your little ones. God did this to me, not you. And though you did it to me and with a different intent, it's God's will and God's intent of how this all came to be saying, for God sent me here. So Joseph's worldview is, is on full display for us here, isn't it? We see Joseph's theology here. Joseph, in fact, uh, was reformed in his theology before that was even a, a word, right? Or even you a know, reformed church before that even became a, a tag or a thing after the Reformation. Uh, he believes in the sovereignty of God in all things. So while bro- his brothers assume the worst here, uh, you know, that is just, uh, again, maybe some more application for us here, to never assume the worst. In fact, of brothers and sisters in Christ, I mean here, we should always assume the best. But do you ever find yourself assuming the worst of people? I find myself doing it. And, and if I find that it gets me thinking things and coming up with like these worst case scenarios that typically never, ever happen. And so you work yourself up, you worry yourself, you get stressed about it, and we know that scriptures tell us not to worry for anything, uh, but to, to pray and, and come to the Lord with thanksgiving in all things. But we work ourselves so much over these things, and we don't need to do that. Instead, we need to assume the best of one another. We need to assume uh, that, oh, they don't really mean to offend me with the way they acted or the thing they said. It was, it was just a mistake. It was something that I took wrong and assume the best of one another. Uh, if we have to send messengers to one another, as we see here in this text, if I have to, to send someone to say to Sky, hey, uh, Craig wants to make sure you forgive him or you're not mad at him about something, there's a problem there. There's a major malfunction happening here, and red flags should be going up for all of us because we've got to be able to communicate with one another. We have to be able to come to one another to say, hey, Bob, uh, the thing I said the other day, I, I pray that you didn't take offense. If you did, I apologize for offending you. We have to be able to talk to one another uh, and, and to come, and if there is sin, the, the scriptures are clear about that, that there, if there is a sin there, we still need to go to one another. So regardless of the circumstance, it may be difficult sometimes, but we are called to communicate with one another and to, the goal of that, remember, is to bring back, you know, into reconciliation, a, a proper relationship here and to restore things that may have been um, stressed to some way. And so we must continue to do that even when it's difficult. Uh, Remember, Jesus instructs us of this in Matthew 5. He says, uh, if you realize that you're at odds with your brother, he's speaking about bringing an offering uh, to to the temple. And he says, if you realize that you're at odds with your brother, leave the offering. Go make amends with your brother and make up with them first and then come and bring your offering. So we see, you know, how he puts an emphasis on, on this. And how does Joseph respond again to this? Very graciously you know, very kindly, very lovingly saying again to, again to them, he repeats it, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. I've done so for almost two decades now. I'm not going to fail to do so or stop to do so because our father is dead. I'm doing this because our father has put me here to do this. And so I will not fail to do that. And look at what it says. Joseph spoke kindly to them and it says they were comforted by his words. That's an excellent thing, uh, that they were comforted as he is reminding them how God has been graciously providing for them through Joseph. And Joseph even, you know, would deflect that, saying, like, I'm not the one providing for us in all of this. It is God who is the one doing this, and, and he has done this to save us and to take care of us. Well, finally this morning, uh, verses 22 to 26, <clears throat> we see the death of a favorite son. We see the final instructions here uh, with the death of Joseph. And not only as as we read that that heading, as I say it, the death of a favorite son, we think back to, uh, you know, his his birth and being born of the favorite wife, Rachel, and how, uh, you know, remember how all this has played out. This all started with him being the favorite one, right? 
His brothers hated him because his father favored him over the rest of them. And God used that to bring to fruition all the things that we have seen. But I don't even simply mean that, but also the death of a favorite son of the nation of Egypt. Think about how Egypt views Joseph, right? They know him as Zaphonath Panea, right? They, I mean, I would, I would say to you, they worship Joseph. Uh, you know, they were idolatrous. They had many gods. They definitely worshiped Pharaoh as not only their ruler, but as their god. And so Joseph, Pharaoh said, who is as wise as this man? This, this is our savior. He has saved not only the nation of Israel and this small family of 70, 75 people, he has saved the entire nation of Egypt, God has, through Joseph. So, of course, the Egyptians love and, in fact, worship Joseph because they view him as a savior. And, and just remarkable as I say that, as I remember so many times that we've seen how Joseph is a type of Christ because he points to Jesus and how Jesus is our savior in all of this. So, as we read this text, so it can kind of be confusing. We skip down to verse 22. And it tells us that Joseph is dying now, and he's 110 years old. So it might appear in the natural reading of the text uh, that Israel dies, and that pretty much immediately Joseph dies. But there is some time that passed here because it tells us that he was 110 years old when he died. Well, we know uh, through math that I can go through with you later, uh, but we know that at the time of Israel's death, Joseph was 56 years old. Okay, so we in fact have a, a time of 54 years passing between these couple of verses here where we just don't get any information. And so that typically happens a lot when you go through the scriptures, you will see that happening. And so understand that there is, you know, 54 years uh, that have passed here <clears throat> before his death. And it's interesting how verse 23 says, uh, Joseph saw the third generation of his sons and their sons were born on Joseph's knees. Remember that phrase? We, we've encountered it a couple times uh, in, in our study, how um, Rachel, remember, was barren, and she desired to have children. Leah had had four children already. She was jealous, and there was the war that was going on between the sisters and the household. And she took her maidservant, remember Rachel did, and gave Bilhah, and it says, to, that I may have children, she may have children on my knees. And that speaks to kind of this adoptive process, that, uh, that you would have these children, they would be born on your knees. This is a saying that means, these are my children. And so Rachel saw those children as her own children until God, we know, blessed her with two children of her own. But what's being said here is exactly that. Remember how Ephraim and Manasseh took their, uh, were taken by their father to be blessed by Israel. And remember the adoption we saw in that, that Israel blessed Ephraim with, and Manasseh, remember, with the hands crossed, and he blessed them with the birthright and said, these two are as Reuben and Simeon. These two I adopt and replace my first two sons with your two sons, and you will have sons, he says to, to Jacob, or excuse me, it's easy to mix up all the J's, isn't it? He says to his son Joseph, your, your next sons will be your own sons. And so here we see Ephraim and Nasa have uh, these grandsons, okay, Joseph's great-grandsons, and they are counted as Joseph's sons. Because of this adoption process, um, he has lost now, Joseph has lost his sons to give his inheritance to. They've received, in fact, the birthright from his father. So if you're following with me, he is now receiving his great-grandsons as his own children so that he can give blessings and in, in, in inheritance to these boys. So it's just kind of a, a, an odd thing for us to think this way, but we see that this is what this, this verbiage means here and that this family is, is continuing to uh, be grown according to God's sovereignty, and now they're being uh, replaced here, and Joseph is receiving someone here. So Joseph now has parting words for his brothers. First, he assures them. He encourages them his brothers, his family, saying in verses 24 and 25, God will take care of you. Is that an encouragement to you today? Think of uh, him caring for the birds and for the sparrows and how much more valuable are you. you your heavenly Father cares for you. And so in this, he assures them, I will take care of you. I will bring you up from this land, he says, to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So again, here we see the faith 
of Joseph saying, look, I'm about to die. I am not going to see this promise come to fruition, just as my father did not and his father and his father before him. But it is going to happen because God has said that it will happen. And so he will do these things for you. Hebrews 11, in fact, uh, speaks to that. Um, the reading that we had from the scriptures by Angelo, uh, speaks of Joseph's faith saying, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So he mentions this exodus, which we can read about in, in our Bible, this account some 400 years later as they will come out of Egypt and he speaks of that even though he dies 400 years before it happens because he believes it by faith and he speaks the truth of the word of God that has been revealed to him. And then he makes orders here concerning his bones, okay? Um, this is interesting. Uh, what is this all about? Verse 25, he makes his brothers swear an oath to him, saying, rem and, and remember, we saw an oath similarly as Israel, remember, was about to die, and he made his son Joseph swear to him to carry his bones back and do not bury me in Egypt, but bury me in this place where I can be buried with my, my family. Now we see Joseph making a similar request. And as I think about it, many commentators that I read uh, say this, and, and I, I think it's an amazing thought that I just want to throw out there real quickly. Um, think about the resurrection. You know, it's, it's a thought of theologians throughout the, the centuries that as Joseph, as, as Israel, as they take their bones back, they fully understand because they're of the faith and they understand that where their bodies lay and where their bones are really don't matter because they will not be there, right? They will be in spirit, in heaven, uh, with Jesus, with God. However, they have an understanding here that they one day will receive glorified bodies, and it says to them, we want to be resting in the promised land that God gave us with our families so that when we are brought to life in the resurrection, we will have an inheritance in this promised land. And it's just a, a, a cool thought to wrap around for us as wherever we die and wherever we're buried or cremated or whatever it is that is your personal preference or however the Lord has that happen, we look forward to the promised land which we will be in instantly, as soon as we pass, as the scripture tells us that, that it is appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment, that we will be before our creator in the ultimate promised land, that we have a, an inheritance of, this eternal inheritance, this living hope that we have in Lord Jesus Christ. What a great thing. Uh, turn with me, please, since we're speaking of Exodus, let's just go turn to Exodus chapter 13, and, and fast forward a little bit and see what happens here. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 13, we're going to look at verse 19. We know that Moses is the leader now at this point. He is leading the people out of Egypt and going into the promised land. And verse 19 of Exodus 13 says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Sound familiar? There's an exact quote of what we're told in our, our text today. This is much later down the line now, and they are continuing to carry the bones of Joseph with them to fulfill this, this oath that he made them swear. Now, fast forward a little bit with me to Joshua. Let's flip forward to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24, because we know, uh, if you know your Old Testament, you've read through the book of Exodus and on, then you know that Moses does not actually come into the promised land. Uh, God uh, takes him up on top of the mountain and allows him to see with all his eye and view all this land, saying that this is the land that I promised, this is the land that the people will receive, but you will not be the one taking them into it. Joshua will be the one to lead them into there. And so we see Joshua becomes the next leader and takes them into what we call the conquest and taking over and defeating the people in the lands of Canaan so that they will inherit this land that was promised to them. So we now look at Joshua 24, verse 32. It says, Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, and that piece of the ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, 
the father of Shechem for 100 pieces of money, and it became an inheritance for Joseph's sons. So some 400 years later, we see Joseph's bones are placed where he had desired for them to be placed. And I think that's a, a pretty cool thing to look at. In fact, we actually find out later in Acts 7, uh, you can read that on, on your own time, study time later, but we find out that the rest of the brothers also die in Egypt and their bones are also taken back to Shechem and they're all put in the resting place there in the promised land instead of being in Egypt. As remember, that's just again a picture for us, but their, their thought process, their understanding was that the entire time that they were in Egypt, and we would say, hey, four centuries is a long time. That entire time they viewed from the beginning, we are just sojourners and wanderers in this land. This is not our home. This is not our place. Pharaoh, thank you for your hospitality. We are just strangers and aliens here, and we will one day have a home. And that's their mentality. And again, application for us is that's our mentality here. We look at this world, we see the things happening around us. It can be very disheartening and very discouraging, but we are called to be light in this dark place. And so find encouragement in that, uh, that we know that this place that is continuing to deteriorate, this, this place that is continuing to go darker and darker as it goes more, farther and farther away from the truths of God's ways, we're called to be light in it. And we're called here for a purpose, but this is not our home. We look forward to a home whose builder and architect is the Lord, and we give thanks and praise for him, and we look forward to that time. Well, <clears throat> so we conclude our study on the book of Genesis. We again uh, see focus here on God's sovereignty. Okay, God's sovereignty. Joseph speaks to this. Look back in verse 19 again. His brothers are worried about how they would treat him, and we looked at this already, but now that their father is dead, how is he going to deal with us? And he says, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? Am I God? What, what can I do in this is what Joseph is saying to him. And so Joseph, Joseph points out to his brothers and us this fact and reality that God is the one who controls all things. That's, in fact, what it means to be sovereign. He is the one who preserves life. He is the one who reveals uh, this, this amazing gift of the gospel. He is the one who brings people unto salvation. He is also the one who brings condemnation and, and judgment. He is the one who is working out all things in accordance to His sovereign will. Uh, turn with me, please, to the New Testament. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. A couple more scriptures to look at here in closing. Romans chapter 12. Let's look at verse 17 to 19. Verse 17 says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So Joseph is saying the same thing that Paul says here. You focus on treating people how you're told to treat people. You focus on tying back to Ephesians, back to First John and our, our Bible studies. And isn't it God amazing again how He just brings it all together over and over and over and over? You be careful how you walk. You walk in the light. If you are in Him, then you walk as He walked. You treat people as He treats people. And this is what John says. This is what Paul says. This is what the New Testament says to us. And so he reminds us here, and Joseph is saying that here, uh, and doing that, in fact, here. You treat people the way that you're told to treat people, and focus on that, and leave the rest to God. I need to remember and be reminded often, God is God, and I am not Okay, I, I am not God. Uh, I, that is just something I think we struggle with in our flesh. We are not in control of all things, nor should I be in control of all things. Okay, He is God. Uh, he does a perfect job of it, and so let's allow Him to do that. Uh, back to our text. Let's look again at verse 20, back in Genesis chapter 50. 
Joseph says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so this speaks of this doctrine and providence we've been talking about a little bit. What do we mean when we speak of providence? What does that mean? Well, we simply mean that there's nothing that happens by chance. There's nothing that happens at random. There's no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as good luck and that you are lucky. That, in fact, is unbiblical thinking. And so I would say to you to even retrain your words, retrain your mind and your heart to say, don't use words like that. We, you know, we don't, we don't need to knock on wood. We don't need to say, you know, good luck with that. Uh, we don't need to say those things. And they become, they're such a habit, right? Because it's just said throughout the world. It's, I said it so many times in my life, uh, but that is just not the case. As children of God, we understand providence, not coincidence, that every single thing that happens is being used to fulfill God's plan that he had prepared before the foundation of the world, before Satan, before sin, before all these things happen. And I know it can make us go crazy and make our brains just feel like they're going to explode to go, why did he create Satan? Why did he make this happen? Why did he put the tree there? All these things, right? But he did it to reveal himself so that he could re receive the most glory that he could receive and in that, my little pea brain finite understanding can understand because it's been revealed that somehow he receives more glory by being merciful and showing grace to sinners who don't deserve it. And he receives great glory from that. And praise the Lord that he does for you and for me, or else we would just be condemned for all of eternity. But he does this to the praise of his glory and grace. He chooses to love sinners and to save sinners. So remember that everything is being worked out in accordance to that plan. Proverbs 16, 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. The lot gets thrown, it's the Lord who makes it fall exactly where it falls. He's the one who does exactly what he wants to happen. So everything that happens in your life happens not by coincidence or chance or at random or by luck. It all happens by providence because we serve a sovereign God. Amen, indeed. So again, take comfort in that. Find uh, peace in that, knowing that as a child of God, the Scriptures tell us that every single thing that comes into your life is being used for one purpose, and that is to conform you into the image of His Son. That means everything. That's why He says, give thanks in all things. That's why He says, rejoice always. Because if you truly believe that every single thing that happens in your life is being received and giving glory to God, and knowing that, that as His child, it's being done for your good, then what do we have to complain about? What do we have to fear? What do I have to worry about? I have no need to worry or to be anxious, which is why he says, be anxious for nothing. Why? Because I don't need to be anxious because God loves me and he provides for me. And no matter what happens, he is for me and not against me. And that should bring peace and comfort to us here this morning. And when we truly believe this, I mean, it... it takes away fear. It wipes out fear. It wipes out anxiety. And I know these are things that many of us struggle with. And I know it's difficult. And I know there's all kinds of things and things even that we can't even control within our bodies. But you know what? God can control those things. And we continue to rely on Him. And we continue to say, you know what, Lord? Your word says this, and I believe it. And help me as I worry. Help me in my stress. Help me in my anxiety. Help me in the things that I struggle with. He's our Father. He wants to certainly help us in these things. And so we bring these things to Him, understanding that God is good. His love for us is great and abundant. And He continues to speak to this in His Word and will continue to reveal it to us, we pray, as we move forward uh, every single day. So abide in Him, abide in His Word and he will abide in you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for the truths of your scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for 
this account of the lives that we've looked at in this study, Lord, of Joseph and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, Lord, uh, back to Noah and all the way back to Adam and Eve and just how you have chosen to reveal this history to us, that you have had a plan even before that history began and that it is good and that you are good and that you are working all things for your good and for your glory. And we know that as your children, that means it's for our good. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, first and foremost for salvation. We thank you that you continue this work in us that you began here this morning and every day, God. I pray that you would uh, give us just a a passion for your word, Lord, just a renewed and revived uh, spirit that we would uh, have a hunger, Lord, for your word, that we would desire to be under it continually, under sound preaching and teaching, that we would continue to feed ourselves and that we would continue to read your word and memorize your word and meditate on your word, that we would know your word, Lord, that it would be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, Lord, that we would be walking by the spirit and not by the flesh. Lord, so that we would be more like you, so that people would see you in us, so that when we go out into this place, we would be shining the light because we're walking in it. And whether that be here, Lord, and so many I know that are from Michigan and Ohio and, and, and New Jersey and just all other places, Lord, we give thanks to you for our brothers and sisters all around this world, the work that you are doing, the family that you are building, this church that you are building. God, refine it, reform it, strengthen it. We know that you purify it through the fire, and God, we look forward to whatever that looks like, that we'd be strengthened, that we'd be a greater lighthouse for you in this dark world. God, we love you, we praise you today, and we give thanks in all things in Jesus' name, amen. Our benediction this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Finally, brethren, rejoice. Be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have an amazing day worshiping Him as you go. God bless you.